Thank you. Thank you, Cahirlach, uh, Laf Cahirlach, Senators, my colleague Colin Markey. Um, I'm delighted to be here. As a Cahirlach went through my committees, I just wanted to touch briefly on uh, the work I uh, do on behalf of citizens across Midlands Northwest, but in particular feed into some of the key topics that I believe uh, should be fundamentally involved in the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, as many of you may know, uh, the election in 2019 was my first involvement in politics. Uh, prior to that, though, I was involved in a lot of advocacy work, speaking on issues like uh, marriage equality, women's rights, and mental health in particular for our younger people. And I very much carry that, or attempt to carry that, into my, my work within the European Parliament, uh, talking about equality, diver diversity, and inclusion into uh, each, each file and each amendment that I put in and that my team puts in. Um, at the moment, I'm working on two pieces of policy, which I consider really to be the utmost of importance for citizens, particularly those um, uh, minority groups and women uh, right across the Midlands Northwest and indeed across the island. Uh, last week in Strasbourg, uh, I was a shadow rapporteur for the EPP on a piece of legislation which called on the Commission to establish gender-based violence as a Euro crime. Um, this, in effect, would make gender-based crimes legal, or I should say illegal, in all EU countries. Gender-based violence is a breach of human rights, and it is happening in Ireland and across Europe. Uh, and we need to legislate and non-legislative actions that address these issues on a European level, not just at home, but right across uh, the EU. With some of the EU countries unfortunately refusing to implement the likes of the Istanbul Convention and some activity regressing on the protection of human rights in other countries, we need to continue to call out the Commission to take action. Because I believe failing to do so uh, and having an uncoordinated approach on gender-based violence puts European women and girls uh, at stake and we certainly cannot allow time to pass. Uh, and I say that simply because if we have young women uh, and girls traveling across Europe, the, their rights should also travel with them, particularly uh, our younger uh, men and women who would travel for Erasmus+. Plus. I'm also working, on a sh uh, uh, working as a shadow rapporteur to strengthen the application of the principle of equal pay for equal work and work of equal value between men and women through pay transparency and the informant uh, enforcement mechanisms. One of the major obstacles to enforcing equal pay is the lack of pay transparency. Uh, the gender pay gap is, as many, if not all, can agree, uh, it's unjustified, it's unfair, and unfortunately will most likely grow, not shrink, due to COVID. With many more women than men taking time out to care for their families, and I'm sure as an MEP for Midlands Northwest, I'm not the only uh, representing hearing that. No doubt many in your constituency is also hearing that. On average, across the EU, women get paid 14.1% less an hour than men in the EU. Um, this translates into women having to work an additional 51 days to earn the same wages as their male colleagues. Equal pay has been enshrined, we're very fortunate, in Irish law for decades, but the reality is the implementation can be very different as it is across the EU. The recent Irish legislation on gender pay gap is something I will be very much using as a baseline, but also hoping to expand on it at EU level for this directive. And as an example of the everyday changes a small increase in transparency can make, it will potentially offer clear criteria for workers to ask their employer for information on their individual pay level and an average pay levels broken down by sex for categories for workers performing the same work or the work of equal value. I share that because I think this will be a fundamental point in terms of fundamental rights coming into the Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, I do want to just add a quick note on uh, vocational education training. Um, uh, this is something I worked on uh, before summer and it's something I think is fundamentally important to Irish citizens um, that uh, and it's an essential tool for young people and adults to find jobs after this pandemic that we've lived through um, with many of Europe's employees and employers unable to find uh, the right skills to fill vacancies, vocational skills have become one of the best ways to mould one's career. Uh, and I certainly hope, uh, if asked from the floor, we can get into it a little bit further. Um, I do want to just add a little note about the Culture and Education Committee. Um, it was music to my ears uh, here, the proposal announced by Ursula van der Leyen during her State of the Union address last week, uh, that 2022 will be dedicated as a European year for youth. 
We all know younger people face the greatest challenges coming out of this pandemic, be it through continuing education, entering the labour market, and maintaining their social, uh, social lives. And many students have lost their part-time jobs and fear, uh, and have ultimate fear about the future. Um, I certainly lived through with the 2007-2008 financial crash. Um, a European year uh, is now an opportunity to bring the needs and fears of young people to the forefront and I certainly hope this feeds into the conference on the future of Europe coming from younger citizens across uh, not just the constituency but indeed across the country. Um, there was a couple of things I wanted to get through but just before uh, I, I wanted to flag particularly for, for sitting in front of you all. Um, as Cahirlik had mentioned, I'm co-chair of the two parliament interest groups dedicated to mental health. And I'm very proud to be a rapporteur on a file entitled Mental Health in the Digital World of Work. Um, and this will be working across the Parliament, uh, uh, through all committees, ensuring that there's a cross-sectional approach to uh, mental health in the digital work. And of course, any feedback that you may have, I hope it feeds into it. Uh, recently, uh, as a member of the Alliance, we have written to National Parliament seeking support for this campaign on an EU year of good mental health. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Senator Francis Black, who very kindly agreed to uh, come on board as a champion for that. Uh, finally, um, uh, as my colleague Colin Markey uh, finished off his sentiments, I also want to do the same in terms of the conference on the future of Europe. Um, during my election in 2019, uh, I was often asked, what do MEPs do and what's the purpose of the European Parliament? Um, I think for me, over the course of the two and a half years, obviously my knowledge has grown. When I connect with people, particularly younger people, it has grown. Uh, but we still have a fundamental uh, work to do, and not just in the Fine Gael party or the EPP party, but right across uh, this house uh, and next door. For many of the citizens, what they know about the EU comes from the form of cap grants, funding for roads, or GDPR. Um, in Ireland, we are aware over the recent years, in particular around the importance of EU solidarity uh, with Brexit. Uh, but this conference is a unique and timely opportunity for citizens to really engage and look at the challenges and the particular interests they have within the European Union be it rural, urban, north, south, east, west. This is uh, a perfect time for us to really discuss as a country where we want to uh, move forward in the European Union. Uh, I do also want to acknowledge, um, for me, as I covered fundamental rights, social issues, I think they're the fabrics of our, uh, of, of our society. And I certainly hope moving forward uh, that we have a stronger sense uh, for our younger people coming, coming forth. And with that,